On the 22nd of January 1941, the Australian 6th Division, supported by the British Monitor Terror, Gunboat Nat and the Australian destroyers Stuart, Vampire and Voyager, took the strategically important North African port of Tobruk. Tobruk, however, was soon isolated in the German-led counter-attack. The siege of Tobruk lasted 241 days and the exploits of the Rats of Tobruk became the stuff of legend. The sustainment of the besieged Tobruk garrison was the task of the Navy, specifically the British and Australian warships of the inshore squadron, which was commanded from the 5th of February 1941 by Captain Albert Poland, Royal Navy. To discuss the hazardous nature of what became known as the Tobruk Ferry Service, or otherwise known as the Tobruk Ferry Run, I'm joined by Peter Poland, the son of Captain, later Vice Admiral, Sir Albert Poland. Peter has recently had published his father's war diaries. Flight Lieutenant Greg Pearce, who is writing a book on HMAS Stewart's Mediterranean deployment from 1939 to 1941. His grandfather, Abel Seaman Torpedoman Jack Cleves, served aboard Stewart. And Rick Pelvin, who has made a study of the RAN in the Mediterranean during World War II. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. First, Rick Pelvin, can you set the scene in the Mediterranean theatre in January 1941? Well, things were looking quite good for the Allies in January 1941. The Navy had achieved uh, dominance over the Italian Navy mm -hmm. in a number of actions, culminating in the attack on Taranto in November 1940, uh, which temporarily crippled the Italian battle fleet. On land, the Italian army had failed to penetrate in any way into uh, Egyptian territory. Brit the British Army had conducted a number of small offensives and eventually this led into Operation Compass, a full-blown mm -hmm. offensive that was to lead to the fall in short order of Bardia, Tobruk, Derna and eventually to Benghazi, uh, led uh, by the Australian 6th Infantry Division. This advance was supported but from the sea by mm -hmm. the uh, Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy and this support was, was vital to the Army advance. Uh, the transport by land was quite difficult, very wearing on vehicles and sea transport was absolutely essential and, and this was acknowledged by General Wavell. Peter Poland, your father took command of the squadron. Where was he based and what sort of ships was, were assigned to the squadron? Well, he, uh, he was based in Tobruk. Initially, the squadron was uh, the Monitor, Terror, and also the gunboats, Nat and Aphis, and there were a few other uh, naval ships. But after the Germans surrounded Tobruk, uh, of course, the, they had to bring in a whole lot more ships in order to supply, and it finished up with something like 139 ships, actually. My father recorded in his notebooks as uh, going into the brook doing the thing. I think one ha also has to remember that there were, in fact, South African uh, Defence Force minesweepers there. There were also some uh, ships, and I'm not sure whether they were Canadian ships, they certainly had Canadian officers, and they were Greeks, and uh, it was uh, 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 this force of 139 ranged from fast mine layers, destroyers, large merchant ships, down to sailing schooners, and even a sponge uh, gathering vessel. <laughs> so it was a, a, a real mixed bag. But he was in control, in control of their movements uh, once they got into the sort of Tobruk area and he was also responsible for um, coordinating with the Air Force. Greg Pearce, your grandfather was in Stuart, the destroyer leader of the 10th Destroyer Flotilla. This was better known as the Scrap Iron Flotilla. Can you tell us about the flotilla? Thank you, Rob. Um, so the, the flotilla consisted of five ships. Uh, Four of the V and W class, Vam HMAS Vampire Vendetta Voyager, uh, the W class Water Hen, as well as Stuart, which was a Scott class flotilla leader, made her only very slightly larger. Um, they were all laid down in the period between 1917 to 1919, and they were loaned to, from the Royal Navy uh, in 1933. Um, they, were, they replaced the five smaller S class destroyers. <coughs> 
Uh, they were rotated through a, a mothball status as a budgetary measure during mm -hmm. the Great Depression, but were then reactivated in 1939 when the storm clouds of World War II were building over Europe. Um, by that stage, they were 20 years old. They had retained their World War I armament configuration with one significant addition, that is the Type 123 Alpha ASTIC set, which was a, an, a primitive uh, anti-submarine sonar system. Uh, <coughs> their first experience against hunting a real submarine with that ASTIC was, occurred in Singapore during an anti-submarine exercise they conducted with HMS Rover. So they were doing trans, uh, training in transit. Uh, and they were also postured during the transit of the Indian Ocean to assist a light cruiser force to search for the German pocket battleship, the Graf Spray. Fortunately for the Scrap Iron Flotilla, the pocket battleship was in the South Atlantic at the time <laughs> and their services were not required. Mm -hmm. uh, the term Scrap Iron Flotilla was an obvious reference to their age and legend has it it comes from a jibe from the German Minister for Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, um, mm. but it was who stated that there was, they were a consignment of junk or scrap iron being sent by the Australian government. Uh, like the term rats of Trebrook, this was uh, worn by a badge of pride by the men. Mm -hmm. um, the scrap iron then joined the 10th destroyer flotilla, which was also known as the wobbly 10th or the Crocs. Rick Pelvin, the scrap iron flotilla was commanded by the charismatic Captain Heck Waller, whom Admiral Cunningham, the CNC in the Mediterranean, described as a great sea captain. Can you tell us a bit about Heck Waller? Yeah, Hector MacDonald Laws Waller entered the Royal Australian Naval College in 1914 and graduated in 1917 and he was sent to the Grand Fleet where he served in the battleship HMS Argencourt. After the First World War he had positions ashore and afloat in both the Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy and during the Spanish Civil War commanded the British destroyer Brazen in the Mediterranean where his ship handling was criticised by his flotilla leader. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he was in command of the Australian destroyer flotilla, that is the scrap iron ships mentioned by Greg. In, 19, in December 1939, the ships were transferred to the Mediterranean and Waller became captain of the 10th destroyer flotilla, which was not only the Australian ships, but four British destroyers as well. He commanded with distinction and his seamanship capabilities were shown when the steward picked up the broken down tanker Trochus and in heavy seas towed her bow to bow in reverse until rescued by tugs. Mm. So he was actually a very fine seaman. He led the flotilla in the, act in the Battle of Calabria and during the Tobruk Ferry and in the evacuations of Greece and Crete. After Stuart returned to Australia, Waller was given command of the cruiser HMAS Perth and was lost with her in the Battle of Sunda Strait on the ninth night of uh, February the 28th, uh, Je March the 1st, 1942. Mm. Well, Peter, what was your father's approach to sustaining Tobruk? Well, uh, unfortunately, his first of his notebooks, I think, was destroyed when his office was bombed on the 24th of April. So I don't have any detailed notes of what he did to start with. But I think uh, uh, when he'd, after he'd taken over the real role of senior naval officer in Saw Squadron, um, I think he, I can say he took a lot of care in organising the passage of ships to and from Tobruk liaising particularly with the aircraft, Air Force in getting a, uh, as much air cover as he could to avoid, the, um, avoid the, their attack because you have to remember that the Germans in fact had bases between uh, Tobruk and where the Allies were at the time which is further back in Egypt. He's very, very concerned with the clearing of wrecks in the harbours in order to get them thing, and particularly when they went up to Benghazi in the initial advance, trying to open up places there because of the importance of getting uh, the supplies through to the army. And uh, then, of course, once Tobruk was there, there were wrecks there, and they had this huge problem of getting a sufficient berths for ships to come in and unload, and they usually used the wrecks that were there as places to unberth and unload. 
I think it's also true to say that he paid a lot of attention to the sailors who were working the port. He, he was very concerned about their morale and uh, when you remember that they were being bombed day and night and they had to work particularly later on at night to unload the ships because they mm. changed the routine. So I think the, you know, he had a lot of things, but the important thing was to get ships in and out of there as quickly as possible in order to avoid the daily attacks by the Luftwaffe. So Greg, how did the commitment of Allied forces to Greece then impact on support to Tobruk? Well, basically, it was uh, a difficulty of being stretched by Hitler's frustrating requirement to continue to save Mussolini in two concurrent operations. Uh, as described, the North African um, forces, including the Australian 6th Division, took Tobruk uh, in, on the 22nd of January. That was three months after Italy's indecisive invasion of Greece. Um, a month after taking Tobruk and after much negotiation, the British then decided to send troops to Greece uh, to mitigate the possibility of a German intervention mm. in, in Greece. Um, however, German, uh, the German general uh, Rommel had landed in North Africa 10 days earlier, on the 12th of February. Uh, and, um, in anticipation of that German invasion, the British forces, including the Australian 6th Division, had been started to relocate from North Africa into Athens from the 7th of March. Um, sensing that strategic opportunity, Rommel not only surprised the Allied High Command but his own by launching his attack some four weeks early, um, or more than four weeks early, I should say, uh, with the first attacks on towns to the west of Tobruk on the 24th of March. Uh, the scrap iron flotilla just simply couldn't be everywhere at once. Uh, the Rommel's initial advance um, during that period, the scrap iron were escorting uh, convoys to Greece. Uh, Water Hen was the only one remaining in North Africa until about the 5th of March when she was also uh, pushed over to, to the Greek uh, campaign. Um, in uh, response to the uh, Rommel's advances in North Africa, the Royal Navy conducted demolition works in uh, Benghazi Harbour on the 3rd of April, which left Tobruk as the most westerly resupply point left available on North Africa. Um, Germany then invaded Greece three days later on the 6th of April. Um, but, and the, during that first half of April, Stuart Vendetta Voyager and Waterhen had returned to support the army in North Africa, providing naval gunfire support from, uh, from the sea, escorting convoys to and from Tobruk and inserting and extracting commandos from various raids. Uh, but by the 10th, um, Rommel um, had commenced his first attack on Tobruk, um, where the 9th Division had replaced the 6th. Um, Greek and British forces could not hold the German advance and the Scrap Iron Flotilla were again withdrawn from North Africa um, across to evacuate troops from southern Greece. Um, and one night of note was the 26th to 27th of April where Stuart and Vampire managed to ferry 2,000 lost New Zealand troops uh, off the beach of Tolo in southern Greece, which wasn't even a designated evacuation point. Um, as Rommel left Tobruk behind and under siege, German paratroopers then assaulted Crete on the 20th of May. Uh, this required the uh, Royal Navy to repeat their Greek evacuation miracle over a period from 28 May to 2nd June, uh, where more ships were lost, but fortunately none from the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, the Greek campaign basically meant there were fewer small ships available to support the army uh, during a critical phase where they were uh, trying to uh, defend key positions and ultimately during a fighting withdrawal. Mm. Peter? I, I think two things. It was very fortunate that they had had time uh, after they took Tobruk initially to get stuff in there because I think my father recorded that they had quite a lot of ammunition and other stores there initially to support the garrison. So uh, that was wrong. But the point about the um, the evacuation from Greece in a period of 10 days from the 21st of May to the 1st of June 1941, the Royal Navy lost uh, two cruisers, an anti-aircraft cruiser and six destroyers, mm. all to the Wolfwaffe. Mm. Well, Rick, Greg mentioned the 3rd of April 1941 and the British withdrawal from Benghazi. What effect did that have on Tobruk? What did it mean for Tobruk? Well, the British Army retreated pell-mell back in across the desert, and, but it was decided to hold Tobruk as a port and to deny the port to the, to the enemy and deny its airbase too. At 
The Australian 9th Division and the 18th Brigade of the 7th Division, supported by uh, British forces with armour and artillery, garrisoned the, uh, garrison the Tobruk Fortress and the Navy had to support them. There was no other way to get supply mm. and that meant the Tobruk Ferry was instituted with the destroyers and with a number of other ships that Peter mentioned earlier. So Greg, during that April, the Scrap Iron Flotilla were involved in the Tobruk Ferry Service. Can you describe what a typical run was like? So prior to Rommel's counter-offensive, the destroyers were essentially just providing conventional escort to merchant ships uh, and convoys into Tobruk. Uh, but um, as has been discussed, as the Luftwaffe picked up their attacks, more shipwrecks, mines uh, choked the channel. Uh, their air dominance over the, uh, the Mediterranean transit routes became more evident and only the nimble destroyers and sloops could basically get into to Tobruk Harbour. The destroyers also had an advantage in speed. They were exposed to that air threat for less time. Mm. Um, they operated in pairs, providing mutual anti-aircraft fire support to each other and a self-rescue capability in case one destroyer was sunk. Um, and their armament had been augmented uh, by the fitment of quad 50 cal machine guns as well as captured Italian Breda 20mm anti-aircraft cannon and some had been fitted with Ehrlichan cannons as well. Uh, a typical run would depart Alexandria, uh, transit to Mersa Matara, uh, which was a supply point for the army that was serviced by both rail and by the, the coast road. Uh, and supplies would be loaded onto the ship in both locations. Everything from bully beef bullets, shells for the artillery, bombs, mortars, petrol cans, uh, precious medical supplies, as well as uh, troop reinforcements. Not all Navy regulations relating to the stowage of dangerous goods could be, a, could be uh, <laughs> adhered to due to the uh, rapid nature of, it, of what was going on. In case of fire and to assist quick offload, uh, most of the cargo was carried on deck. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to quote from Petty Officer Riley, who was a crew aboard HMAS Voyager. The Trebrook Ferry Service is not so hot. Going up last time, the ammunition over my boiler room caught fire. More by luck than good management, they threw the boxes that were on fire overboard in time, although one box of 303 bullets caused a bit of a thrill when they started going off. <laughs> I happened to be in the boiler room at the time, as usual when anything happens, and I could smell it burning, although I never realised what it was. Uh, so the departure from Musa Matara was generally timed so the ships would arrive in Trebrook around midnight. Uh, yeah. The passage was made as far out to sea as practicable to avoid observation of their transit from shore. Uh, and they would have to then, in the dark, thread their way past numerous obstacles in the channel leading into the harbour. Uh, HMO's Voyager damaged her Astic Dome on a submerged um, obstacle. And in one uh, insertion, Stuart badly damaged her starboard propeller after hitting a sandbar. Mm. And that was caused by taking evasive action in the channel when she was attacked by an airstrike during the night where there was a full moon. Um, uh, one ship would then pull in generally to what was left of the wharf and the other would offload into lighters in the middle of the harbour. Uh, the cargo was offloaded as soon as possible as German artillery would periodically shell the harbour at night and there were also air raids. Uh, the destroyers would then take on board wounded and then thread their way back out to sea, hopefully before dawn brought the Stukas back. Um, one quote from able seaman Les Clifford, who was a signalman aboard Stuart, uh, he said, Mess tables on the upper decks were dismantled and stretchers were laid on the deck. The medical officer and sick berth attendant walked around to each case, giving attention to those in need. Some were badly wounded and were given a shot of morphia to ease their sufferings. Several pots of tea were wet for our passengers and they were made as comfortable as circumstances would permit. The destroyers would then run back to Mersa Matara, load up again for another run into Tobruk the following night before returning to Alexandria. And that was the grinding four day cycle. Yeah. Uh, often repeated without a break, all hands were involved in loading, unloading and stowage of the cargo and they were at action stations pretty much for most of the transit. Mm. Rick, another strange ship, Parramatta, soon joined the Tobruk Ferry Service. What sort of ship was she? Well, Parramatta was a sloop. Now that's not a term that's used for warships these days. It's an old term that dates back to the age of sail, but it was revived by the Admiralty in the First World War for smaller ships involved with patrol, escort and mine sweeping duties. They continued developing the class after the, Second World, after the First World War mm -hmm. and by the early 1930s 
it had evolved to the Grimsby class, of which the Royal Australian Navy built two ships and then another two in the late 1930s, and one of these was Parramatta. These ships were armed with uh, three and later four four-inch guns, uh, with uh, both anti-aircraft and surface capability. They were also armed with depth charges and given the ASDIC, which was a submarine detection equipment. At 1,000 tonnes, they were smaller than a destroyer, when 16 knots, only about half as fast, but they were far better equipped for escort service. Now in June 1941, Parramatta arrived in the Mediterranean and it was immediately put onto convoy work supporting the Army. Mm, great. Peter, can you describe how your father differently employed the destroyers and the sloops? Well, he, he employed the destroyers to do these fast runs, as, uh, as has been described, this business of leaving Alexandria going to Mesmatru, picking up more stores, and then doing the fast run into, uh, into, um, uh, into Tobruk during darkness hours. I mean, that was fine, except on moonlight nights, of course, because they were going fast, their wake could be mm -hmm. picked up. But that's what the destroyers were doing. The, the other ships, like, uh, like the Parramatta and the and the Grimsby and uh, eventually the Yarra were all more on escorting the merchant ships and other things. They also had these tank landing craft and occasionally they went and uh, escorted them. But the tank landing craft, uh, uh, although slow and uh, had the big disadvantage of having very noisy engines so they couldn't hear any aircraft, um, they did a fantastic job and uh, uh, there's some wonderful accounts of those, particularly in uh, Anthony Hickstall Smith's uh, book on Tobruk, because he was involved in those as well. Greg, there were many incidents during the, the ferry runs. Can you tell us a little bit about the one involving the merchant vessel Vita? This really is a story of a favour that got returned to the Scrap Iron Flotilla in some way. Uh, on the 14th of April 41, uh, the day after Rommel's Easter battle against the Tobruk garrison, uh, hospital ship number eight, also known as the ship uh, Vita, had departed Trebrook uh, with 422 patients aboard. Uh, a formation of JU-87 Stuka dive bombers then attacked um, the, uh, the Vita, uh, as witnessed by crew on HMAS Waterhen. And I'd like to quote A.V. Uh, Haydeck. Um, Her red crosses and white upper works gleaming and showing for miles She'd only gone two miles when nine German dive bombers dived one after the other down through the clouds and let go their 1,000 pound bombs from a height of a few hundred feet. Luckily, she didn't score a direct hit, but four near misses exploded under her, blew her engine room in, and of course she started to fill. We took her in tow, but she was going down too fast. So we came alongside. It was quite dark by now, cold, and the sea was damn rough. We got all the patients aboard and had some trouble with the 24 stretcher cases. Just imagine it. Chaps without legs, some without arms, some smashed up with shrapnel, but all in a very bad way and only rough field dressings on their wounds. Mm. This, is not a, this is only a small destroyer and we are crowded at any time. But with an extra 500 with nurses and doctors, etc., we were walking over them on the mess decks and around the guns. Some had only pyjamas and shivered all night. We were short of food, been out nearly a fortnight, and all we could give them was bully beef and biscuits and plenty of tea. Waterhen then towed the empty Vita back to Trebrook and transported the wounded to Alexandria. On the 4th of May, the hospital ship Carapara was similarly attacked by Stukas when she had 164 wounded aboard, though luckily uh, she made it back to Alexandria on one engine. That left the Dorsetshire, the last remaining British hospital ship left on the North African theatre and it was decided not to risk her on a run to Tobruk. Mm. So from early May, the destroyers and sloops of the Tobruk ferry service became the only means of evacuating wounded out of Tobruk. Mm. The Vita limped back to Alexandria after some emergency repairs and survived another air attack en route uh, and then was transited across to Bombay, India for a more substantial uh, set of repairs and refit. She re-entered service in the Indian Ocean after um, uh, where she managed to return her favour to the Scrap Iron Flotilla on the 9th of April 1942 when HMAS Vampire and HMS Hermes 
were both sunk off Sri Lanka by a Japanese airstrike. Uh, Vita conducted the rescue and took aboard 590 survivors from both ships. Vita survived World War II, returning to merchant service in 1945 and was scrapped in 1949. Mm. Rick Pelvin, Parramatta had an action-filled stint with the Tobruk Ferry Service. Can you tell us about her escort of the petrol carrier Pass of Belhama in 1941? Yeah, Pass of Belhama was a small ship of about 750 tonnes and quite slow at about nine knots. She carried petrol into the Tobruk garrison. Uh, indeed, she was a floating bomb. Mm. On the 22nd of June, Parramatta and the sloop Auckland were escorting parts of Belmaha to, to Brook when they were attacked by some 60 German dive bombers. A fierce action resulted uh, in the course of which Auckland was hit on the stern and eventually sunk. Parramatta went in to try and pick up her survivors but air attacks forced her to back off. She continued to fight the dive bombers right through the day and into the night. Uh, it's, she is credited with shooting down three. Later on, the destroyers Vendetta and Waterhen came up in support. The, these two destroyers took past a Belmaha, which was damaged and had to be towed, into Tobruk, while Parramatta picked up Auckland survivors and returned them to Alexandria. Hmm. The handling was commented on by the Admiralty uh, most favourably. Well, Greg, just five days later, the RN suffered its first warship loss of the war. Can you tell us about that? <clears throat> so it was HMAS Waterhen, and she was the fourth vessel of the 10th destroyer flotilla to be sunk, but as you pointed out, the first RAN warship to be sunk by enemy action in the Second World War. And the incident really did validate the tactics of operating the destroyers in pairs. Um, she had departed uh, Nusa Matara on the 29th of June uh, in company with HMS Defender. It was Defender's first run to Tobruk. Um, Waterhen's cargo consisted of 70 troops, 50 tonnes of stores, including two large jars of acid. Um, they transited at the high speed of 25 knots, um, but at uh, 5.30 in the evening, uh, the destroyers were located by a formation of 15 JU-87 Stuka dive bombers operating in three flights of five aircraft. Uh, the first flight attacked the HMS Defender, um, who survived uh, two near misses. The second flight then rolled in on, on um, Waterhen. Both ships were zigzagging. Both ships were providing mutual fire support mm -hmm with their 4.7 inch main guns, 3 inch anti-aircraft guns, 20 millimeter Ehrlichens and machine guns. The caliber of the weapons employed decreased with the altitude of the aircraft, obviously. Um, one of the first bombs exploded close to stern to, to Waterhen uh, and threw dirty water and shrapnel over her stern, um, probably damaging her rudders. From that point, she didn't answer the helm. Uh, then another four bombs exploded as near misses and midships, uh, bursting the seams between her hull plates and flooding her engine room. Um, I'd like to quote Seaman Orkins, who was in the forward magazine at the time with his mate Strippy. Uh, Just then a violent lurch and submarine concussion. She gave an awful shudder. It felt like your hand on the heart of a human being feeling his death shudder. My hair stood on end and we stared at each other. The poor old chook stopped. Still shivering, she began to sway with a helpless sort of feeling, and we knew she was done. The stacked to deck cargo was thrown about a bit, but probably did actually save some of the troops from flying shrapnel. Uh, and fortunately, the consignment of acid had not been damaged. Uh, the troops and sailors alike pitched in to start jettisoning stuff over the side, but that wasn't enough to save the ship. Defender approached uh, Waterhen bow to bow, and took everyone off, including the ship's dog, Stuka. And the captain uh, was Lieutenant Commander Swain, who was the last to leave. After sunset and the air threat had passed, the two destroyer captains thought it worth attempting to tow Waterhand back uh, to Musa Matara. And on approaching the ship, they spotted a submarine on the surface near Waterhand. Uh, Defender opened fire and shell strikes were seen around the surface of the water around the submarine, uh, which then crash dived. Um, believe she fired two torpedoes which ran underneath Defender without striking or exploding uh, 
um, and Defender followed up with a, a depth charge attack. The ASTIC operators lost contact with the submarine after two possible secondary explosions after the depth charges had detonated. After um, an attempt to tow uh, Waterhen uh, was abandoned at 2300 hours, uh, she floundered some 50 miles off Solom. The loss of Waterhen remain, and, uh, does rate a mention in a letter my grandfather wrote to my grandmother at the time, though through OPSEC he didn't actually name the ship. Mm -hmm. Um, did you receive word of the loss of one of our ships? How did they put it over the air? I hope not an Australian destroyer sunk and no name. That would only get people worried. Mm. Still, they were very lucky. And if our turn has to come, let's hope it will be as good. Well, Peter Poland, your father was not content to sit behind a desk and did several runs in his ships. What can you glean from his diaries? Well. Uh, he, uh, he, went to, uh, he was called to Cairo quite frequently, uh, particularly when the, they, were doing, they were doing an attempt to uh, relieve Tobruk, which didn't work. And I think on four occasions he went there. And then I think he took passage almost exclusively in the uh, scrap iron flotilla ships. And uh, he usually went by ship to Mirza Matru and then on by uh, either rail or, or by aircraft. Uh, whilst he seems to have had a lot of meetings there, uh, it did enable him to have a few luxuries, like a hot bath. Um, he told Admiral Cunningham that half a gallon of saline water was not really ideal to uh, survive on, but that's what they had. Uh, so I think he was, he was grateful to go there, but he always said it was good to get back and make sure that everything was running properly. Greg, the wear and tear on the ships and men of the Scrap Iron Flotilla was, was obviously significant from July they were withdrawn. Can you tell us a bit about that? So I've only got statistics for Stuart um, and surprisingly um, over her most of her two year deployment uh, she was able to put to sea between 60 to 70 percent of days per month. Uh, now that's discounting a four month period between August and December 1940 leading up to and during her major refit in Malta of course. Uh, but that is a real credit to the engineering department on board the ship um, and from what I've read they would be the hardest working guys on the crew because mm. uh, she did break down a lot. Um, as previously mentioned she had a propeller strike um, in the entrance to Tobruk Harbour and that later up in Alexandria dock for some 10 days. But what ended her deployment occurred on the 26th of July 1941 when returning from Tobruk to Alexandria her port side turbine completely failed. So they completed the run on the starboard repaired unit. Um, when they opened up the turbine in Alexandria, several of the turbine blades had completely stripped off the turbine. Um, repair and replacement of such a unit uh, was beyond the capability of the dockyard in Alexandria. And so she was ordered to proceed to Australia for a, a, a refit on the remaining starboard engine. Uh, she made revolutions for 20 knots, which gave her 15 knots of headway. And that was with tw 12 degrees of starboard rudder to keep her straight. Oh, goodness. Uh, she departed Alexandria on the 22nd of August and relative to the other scrap iron flotillas she had a fairly uneventful transit back to Port Melbourne arriving on the 27th of September. Waterhen, as we covered earlier, had sunk by the time uh, Stuart departed the Mediterranean. The Vampire was the first to leave on the, in May 1941 due to excessive vibrations at speed above 16 knots and a range of other defects. Uh, she required a refit and was sent to Singapore. Um, she managed to pass through refit and join the Royal Navy China Station against the Japanese. Uh, she rescued survivors from HMS Repulse and, uh, and Prince of Wales when they sank. And after the fall of Singapore, transferred to at first Java and then the Indian Ocean. And as discussed earlier, uh, was involved in the valiant attempt to protect the aircraft carrier HMS Hermes, uh, um, where she had her second her, had a meeting with with Vita. HMAS Voyager also limped back to Alexandria on one engine uh, on the 13th of July and like Stuart um, uh, was then sent back to Australia for refit, um, arriving in Sydney on the 25th of September 1941. She conducted some uh, duties in home waters before running aground on the south coast of Timor on the 23rd of September during an operation to insert and extract a commando company. Mm -hmm. Uh, she was scuttled on the beach because she couldn't be recovered and the ship's company was evacuated by HMA ships Warrnambool and Kalgoorlie. But it was Vendetta that most definitely had the longest trip home. Mm. 
Um, she was the last to leave the Mediterranean on the 20th of October 1941 and like Vampire has been sent to Singapore for a major refit. Um, during the fall of Singapore she was in pieces. Um, most of the crew had been sent away on leave, remaining 21 uh, personnel. Then had a Herculean task of scouring all the workshops in Singapore for the bits and pieces. Uh, stowing them on board the ship while contributing to the anti-aircraft defence of Singapore, uh, during which they uh, claimed one J uh, Japanese bomber with the three-inch gun that they'd set up on the, on the dock. Uh, and then six days before the Japanese stormed across the, uh, uh, the strait from Malaysia into Singapore, she commenced a 15-day tow uh, to Fremantle, and it took 72 days for her to be towed to Melbourne without power, on cold rations, um, no flushing toilets. Um, she was then reassembled, refitted, and then served out the war in home waters and the Pacific. Mm. Amazing ship. <laughs> Peter, with the withdrawal of the destroyers, what, what took their place? Well, uh, obviously the Royal Navy destroyers did, but the, uh, the Australians did have uh, a connection there. They had two destroyers, the Napier and the Nizam, who did runs into Tobruk. Uh, I think uh, they had six visits. Parramatta uh, did six uh, trips, and it was on the last one of those in, on the 27th of November that she was torpedoed. And the last Australian ship was the Yarra, and she made four trips, when, and the last of those was when she towed uh, HMS Flamingo into Tobruk on the 7th of December, just as the siege was ending. Rick. There'd been two previous attempts uh, to relieve Tobruk, but the third one, Operation Crusader, succeeded. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that run and why it was bittersweet for Australia? Yeah, um, Operation Crusader ground inexorably towards the port of Tobruk, and the garrison was attacking in support of the uh, in support of Crusader. That caused an ammunition shortage, and a cargo of ammunition was put aboard the mer slow merchant ship Hammer and escorted by Parramatta and a small destroyer, Avon Vale. On the night of the 26th of November, it was very dark, it was pouring rain, very high seas running. And if we take the scene back to September, about that time the German Navy had introduced U-boats into the Mediterranean and they had made their mark quickly by sinking the battleship Barham and the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. Now it was one of these U-boats, U-559, was off the North African coast on the night of 26 November and around about 10.00 or 10pm 10 a lightning flash highlighted at the small convoy escorted by Parramatta and Avon Vale. The U-boat stalked the convoy for two hours and shortly after midnight fired three torpedoes which missed. She closed the convoy and fired a torpedo at what she thought was a small destroyer with a single funnel. It was actually Parramatta. The torpedo hit and probably hit a magazine. The ship blew up. Her captain, Lieutenant Commander Walker, only had time to order abandoned ship before the ship rolled over and sank. All the officers and 138 of her crew were lost only 25 surviving. The loss was a, with the, the heavy loss of crew was a massive blow to the Royal Australian Navy, but it was made even more uh, serious by the loss pre just previously of HMA Sydney with all hands on the 19th of November. Mm. Well, Greg, the submarine that sank Parramatta, you 559 was to play an inadvertent role in the ultimate Allied victory. Can you explain? Uh, look, it, it is an interesting sidebar. Um, U559's uh, code books were captured and the, uh, uh, the, the code breakers at Bletchley Park were then able to break the shark code that the Germans had used to coordinate U-boat wolf packs in the North Atlantic. Uh, so some 11 months after she sank Parramatta, um, U559 was sunk uh, north of Port Said on the 30th of October 1942 in what was a multi-platform joint operation, two RAF aircraft, some five Royal Navy destroyers in an action that took some 16 hours. Uh, 
Um, Lieutenant Tony Fasson, able seaman Colin Grazer and canteen assistant Tommy Brown boarded the submarine and seized two Enigma code books and other items of intelligence value. Sadly, Lieutenant Fasson and A.V. Grazer were trapped inside the submarine and drowned. All three men were awarded the George Cross. Um, now, it's important to point out Enigma was not one code. It was an encryption technology behind a whole family of codes. So it wasn't a case of Britain having one breakthrough and then being able to read Germany's mail. It wasn't that simple. Um, for a number of years, uh, most of the Enigma machines in German service had three rotors with 26 letter combinations per rotor. 26 to the power of three was the number of possibilities per coded letter. Um, but it had become evident uh, in about 1942 that Germany was introducing an Enigma machine with a fourth rotor. Uh, so for some nine months, uh, the code breakers at Bletchley Park couldn't get into the submarine codes because they were being used by this fourth rotor. Um, and what the code books from U559 were able to, uh, to help them with was the fact that the Navy was in, the German Navy was in transition. The weather messages were still being sent on a three rotor machine, but they used the same encryption key for the day as the fourth rotor machine. So once they cracked the weather messages, uh, not only did they give them a weather report, but it also gave them the encryption key for the day, and they just needed to work through the additional 26 combinations to get into the operational messages that were being directed, uh, that were directing the wolf packs around the North. Atlantic. Now I'm sure a professional cryptologist would say it was far more complicated than that, but in simple pub talk that's kind of how it went. Um, that meant that the Royal Navy was able to direct North Atlantic convoys away from the known location of German wolf packs and of course, more seriously for the Germans, direct anti-submarine forces toward those wolf packs. Um, by the end of World War II, the German U-boat force had lost 805 submarines with some 28,748 men. Well, Peter, uh, uh, I've just been reading a book about the wolf packs. They might have lost 800 submarines, but they sank over a thousand merchant ships. Mm -hmm. Quite so. Well, Peter, thinking about Tobruk, now the siege has been lifted, but presumably uh, the area still required resupply by sea. Oh, Can you yeah, tell us but about the that? As, as one appreciates, the army needs a huge amount of stuff. And uh, the North African campaign is full of the things that people who overstretch themselves and have problems supplying and that's why they were pushed back. After Tobruk was relieved, it became the port to get stuff in. My father records that they went up to Derna and Benghazi, but they found those two ports in such a state that it was impossible. But the fact that they had Tobruk enabled them to bring in a lot. They bring in, uh, on some occasions, well over a thousand tonnes of stores a day. and. Uh, uh, of course, it, it relieved the fact that they were otherwise would have been reliant on trucks, and fairly ancient trucks too, by comparison, over very rough roads and so on. So it, it was important that they do that. And as the, as the army drove Rommel back, my father's notes are full of the amount of stores coming in each day and, you know, how they tried to get more and more and more. Very important. Rick, the scrap iron flotilla and Parramatta clearly made a, a significant contribution uh, to resupply there. Is there any uh, facts or figures worth sharing? The destroyers of the scrap iron flotilla are the best known of the mm -hmm. RAN contributors to the Tobruk run. Uh, Stewart made uh, 34, 24 runs, Voyager 11 and Waterhen 13 before she was sunk. Vampire only made two before her deteriorating material state led her to be sent home. Uh, the newer N class also contributed. Uh, Nizam made 14 runs and Napier 7. But the record was held by HMAS Vendetta under Captain Rhodes, or, or Commander Rhodes, I should say. 39 trips, taking 1,532 troops in, taking 2,951 troops out, and bringing in 616 tonnes of stores. Now, in addition to this, we've mentioned Parramatta, and Peter mentioned HMAS Yarra, which later in the campaign uh, escorted ships into Tobruk. Mention should be made too of the cruiser Hobart, uh, 
Uh, she was part of the 7th Cruiser Squadron mm -hmm. and part of the main Mediterranean fleet. And she carried out bombardments and uh, covered operations at sea. The old destroyers were becoming worthy of their name after 18 months in the Mediterranean, and we've already mentioned their material condition. But I'd like to give a quote from Admiral Cunningham, who said, the ships were literally dropping to bits after much hard work. Indeed, patched up again and again, and all in need of extensive refits, they were only kept running by the sheer grit and determination of the officers and men of their engineering departments. And the run was very hard on the men as well as the ships. They were tired from the rapid operational tempo, and whenever they went to sea, they had the threat of bombs and mm. submarines. Even by night, the ships were bombed. Stuart, I think, seven times on one run. When in Tobruk there was no rest, they had to help load and unload the ships. They did a magnificent job, I, I believe. Uh, I have, don't have the figures in front of me, but I think if I remember rightly, the, uh, during the total siege, the ships uh, of the inshore squadron took something like 32,000 people into Tobruk. And that was, of course, when they changed over the garrison with the uh, Australians coming up. And they took uh, 33,000 people out. They also took 7,000 wounded people out and 7,000 prisoners, which the Australians had captured in their sorties. And as for the number of stores and things, they took quite a lot of number of tanks in there, guns, ammunition stores, food, petrol, Goodness knows what. Uh, on one occasion, one of the ships, the um, uh, uh, I can't remember, it was a schooner that Pedro Palma ran, actually carried 161 sheep because the Indians wanted, who were in the garrison, wanted sheep, live sheep, to eat. <laughs> Goodness. Well, Peter, can you briefly tell us what your father went on to do after commanding the inshore squadron? Yeah, well, fortunately, he was relieved in early March, just after Rommel started uh, his eastward uh, advance, and which led to the fall of Tobruk. He had a week's leave in Alexandria, mainly spent in getting his wardrobe up to scratch, but he then took over as the captain destroyers of the 14th destroyer flotilla in HMS Jarvis. Now, two days after taking command of this, he led his four uh, flotilla out as part of a force under uh, Rear Admiral Philip Vaughan, with the f who had five light cruisers, who, which had 5.5-inch guns, and another destroyer flotilla to protect a Malta convoy um, from an Italian battleship, the Littorio, mm. two heavy cruisers and destroyers. Now, they had a running action, uh, lots of smoke, Dad got within uh, three miles of the Littorio, which is quite a thing when it's got sort of huge guns firing at you. The fired uh, torpedoes uh, got the team to turn and fire torpedoes, and fortunately the battleship and the other uh, heavy ships all turned and went home, so they didn't uh, attack the Malta convoy. Unfortunately, because of the, the uh, diversions they had to make, the ships were caught by the Luftwaffe before getting to Malta, so some of them were destroyed. He had another excitement on an occasion later on uh, when uh, he uh, took four ships out from Alexandria, came back two days later with 622 survivors of the other three ships, all of which had been bombed in, uh, in, uh, by the Luftwaffe. Life, uh, but it's interesting, his notes do record some interesting things in uh, his time in Alexandria, and one of them is something that I've never ever seen in any account of anybody during the war, and it says, it was a quiet day, doing my tax return. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, tragically your grandfather did not survive the war. What happened? Look, look, like so many of the Scrap Iron Flotilla men, he was posted onto other ships afterward. Um, in his case, he, uh, he returned to Australia with Stuart, uh, which was handed over immediately to Williamstown Dockyard in Melbourne for uh, an, a, a refit, uh, and she was reconfigured for escort and anti-submarine warfare duties. During that refit, her two triple torpedo launches were removed. Um, 
that meant his job on the ship was gone. Uh, but in order to eke out more shore time with his family, he stayed on for uh, part of the refit period, but was, um, was then posted onto HMAS Canberra. Now, as a senior able seaman torpedo man with combat experience firing torpedoes at anger at the Battle of Cape Matapan, it, I guess it made sense to put him on a ship that had been a de facto training vessel and that was being worked up for the Pacific campaign. And I can only assume they wanted him to train up the, the, the guys that had signed on for the duration. He was aboard uh, Canberra when she was sunk on the 9th of August 1942 at the Battle of Savo Island in the Solomons. Uh, the Canberra had been at second degree readiness for some days before the action, so we assume that he was somewhere in the vicinity of the torpedo space during the battle, and that area of the ship sustained several direct hits from 8-inch shell. Um, she, he was listed as a missing, presumed killed. Um, my family draws comfort from knowing that the, the crew did not abandon Canberra until every body had been accounted for. And my grandmother was with her brother, David Morton, when she received the telegram. Her brother was a veteran of the Boer War, the Gallipoli campaign and the Western Front, so she was with family who, who understood. Mm. Mm. Well, gentlemen, to conclude, can I ask you each for any final thoughts? Uh, Rick? Well, the Tobruk Ferry took place uh, at a time when the Mediterranean fleet was very heavily involved in a lot of other campaigns and a lot of other important operations. There were the evacuations of Greece and Crete, there was the reinforcement of Cyprus, there were bombardments, there were convoys. There's a heck of a lot going on in the Mediterranean at the same time as the Tobruk ferry is running. And the ferry must have been a really hard ask at, at this particular time. Mm -hmm. It was a time when the German Air Force and the German submarines, as well as the Italian Air Force and the Italian Navy, uh, were considerable threats. Uh, command of the sea had to be maintained and still Tobruk had to be reinforced. It was a pretty, it was an amazing operation in those circumstances. Indeed. Greg. I recall um, as a boy I had participated in the Anzac Day March in Sydney um, and wore my grandfather's medals in remembrance. Uh, and I met two members of the British ex servicemen's Club, both retired senior army officers. Both had the Africa Star. One of them had the Trabuk clasp. Uh, and they asked about the medals I wore and who I was remembering. Uh, and when I said that my grandfather had been in the Navy, they kind of looked at me funny. And one guy said, if he'd been in the Navy, how is it he has an Africa Star? And I said, oh, that's because he served on the Trabuk ferry run. And he just stopped and he looked me in the eye and he said, ah, well, that'd be fair enough then. And I think that speaks to the quite enduring respect between the rats of Trebrook and the men of the scrap iron. Mm, indeed. I think yeah. uh, two or three things. Uh, I, um, I think I'm right in saying Brendan Nelson of the uh, War Memorial uh, wrote that the siege of Tobruk was one of the longest in the history of British military history. Uh, and when you think about what it took to maintain that. Uh, my father always talks about the good discipline and leadership and training of people and I think that was the difference between particularly the Italian Navy and the British Navy. But I think there's another point. Interestingly enough, the other day I uh, met with uh, the Governor General, Sir Peter Co uh, General Sir Peter Co Cosgrove, and we were talking about Tobruk, and he said something which hadn't really struck me before, and that was that if it hadn't been for the fact that the Navy was there to supply Tobruk during the siege, the siege would not have lasted. Mm. Indeed. Sadly, that's all we have time for. My thanks to Greg Pearce, Rick Pelvin, and Peter Poland. Thank you for joining us. And for more information on the Australian Naval History video and podcast series, simply search for Naval Studies Group on your search engine. Goodbye for now.